Julie, I think it would be helpful to start with how does children's grief differ from adult grief? I would say that there are many ways in which children's grief differs from adult grief. I think one thing to be aware of is that oftentimes grieving parents make the assumption that their child is grieving in the exact same way they are. And we've learned through our research that that's usually not the case and that kids can um, experience similar feelings as adults after the death of a loved one, but some of those feelings are different. So for example, with children, especially young children, what we typically see is that they have sort of an approach avoidance response to the death of the loved one. So for example, they might be um, very sad and very upset, and then five minutes later, they're outside playing and experiencing joy and doing things they like to do. And then they might come back inside and 20 minutes later, they're sad again. And so we kind of see that flip flopping a lot with children where um, it's not always consistent. And I think oftentimes, again, very well-meaning parents get worried about that, thinking, well, they don't really seem to be grieving in the same way or they're not that consistent in their grief. And we know that that's perfectly normal. We also know that within children's grief, we see three primary bereavement related challenges that not all adults experience, but the first is separation distress, that is yearning and longing for the person who died. The second is identity distress, feeling lost without the person. And the third is circumstance related distress, where they become very preoccupied with the way the person died. And I won't go into detail here, but the bottom line is that the way those different challenges manifest in children looks a little bit different. And so yearning and longing for a young child might be more focused on, well, who's going to take me to school? Who's going to help me with my homework? Very focused on the present. Um, whereas older kids or even young adults might be focused more on the future. They're not with me now, but what am I going to do when I graduate or how who's going to walk me down the aisle? So those are the kinds of things that we often see in, in kids and then certainly teenagers. I was interviewed to promote this webinar on a radio show this morning, and I was asked why kids have an especially hard time with loss. And I said, actually, I feel like kids do it better than we do because they haven't learned to, to clamp down those um, emotions and experiences. And we're actually the ones often who are sort of modeling this avoidance of our feelings. And I feel like especially um, with a death like a suicide we have so much more programming around discomfort with that topic. So um, I'm going to open this to the panel. Maybe Adam, I see you nodding. Um, yeah. What we can do to sort of watch subtle messaging we may be conveying about our own discomfort with this topic. And, and that's not, we'll be realistic. It's not like you can suddenly tell yourself, I'm not going to be uncomfortable with this, but how to navigate that so that your discomfort doesn't become the thing that they model. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking a lot about projections and how we as, quote, grownups project a lot onto the youth that we are supporting, the youth that we are working with. Uh, and this also includes our feelings around some really complicated situations, suicide, uh, incarceration, um, you know, big deal events, you know, wars and, and school bombings and, and shootings and things of that nature. And it's our projections, it's what we are holding. So, you know, uh, there's a, a really great drama therapist and expressive arts therapist named Dr. Britton Williams, who speaks to minding our bias. And when we mind our bias, we locate ourselves and we acknowledge what we are holding. And that enables us to be more present because we're able to see this is mine and this is what I'm holding and this is not yours. And that's a really important step in terms of uh, working with and 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 also being present. I also want to introduce the the concept of harm reduction. You know, how do we take what's happening? You know, that is uh, labeled uh, with stigma and shame and negativity, and how do we minimize it? You know, we're speaking to public health crises a lot of times. We're speaking to human rights crises a lot of times around this stuff. And how do we use a harm reduction approach to say, yes, this is happening? Um, but reduce some of the stigma attached by rooting it in a community-based and public health practice, right? I feel it's really important to acknowledge and engage. And lastly, I'll say education. You know, education, the word, you know, we brought in suicide, right? Suicide is prevalent across all communities in its own way. And so what does suicide mean? You know, how does it happen? And developmentally, there's ways to talk to a two-year-old, a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old. There's ways in which to introduce this to them so that this way they become literate and have an understanding and they're not afraid of it. And if they are afraid of it, guess what? 
That is also okay, but they're afraid based upon knowledge, not a lack of knowledge. And that is so, so, so important. And we need to, last thing I'll say about this here in this moment is we need to really be in touch with what we're feeling around it and be careful not to bestow that on to others. Allow them to have their experience, allow them to have the education so that this way they can move through and develop their, their thoughts and feelings about it in a way supported and guided by us. Uh, and that's really, really important. So much good stuff. I'm seeing lots of great reactions um, in the chat. And also just to kind of place myself uh, as a proxy to make sure I'm understanding this also on behalf of um, folks watching and listening, um, as you were talking about um, not projecting, owning what's ours and what's theirs in in practicality, would that look like, you know, I may be, you know, I'm, as you're talking about a uh, death by suicide, you know, I'm, I'm feeling kind of uncomfortable, but that's, that's my stuff. Um, and if you sense that, I want to make sure you know that that is mine. It doesn't have to be your, it, like that kind of language. Is that what we're talking about? Okay, great. I just want to make sure. Absolutely. That's what we're talking about. And Lindsay, you know, the students that you showed through the video, right? They said, don't, don't infantilize us. Don't, don't baby us. Uh, please be real. And, you know, it was said, I forget, it was either Kate or Julie who said, and maybe it was you, Lindsay, they're not going to ask questions or inquire about things that they're not ready for. If they're inquiring, there's a curiosity, which speaks to a need that needs to be uh, accessed, a need that needs to be addressed, because it takes bravery and courage to ask some of these big deal questions. And if they're asking these big deal questions, then I hope that we are ready to respond in the best ways that we can. Julie, I want to go back to you about the difference that validation versus invalidation can make to anyone, but especially a child or teen as they navigate their grief experience for whatever type of loss they may be grieving. You know, I think as we all do, when we feel seen and heard, it is the best feeling in the world. And I think because our society is always so focused on fixing the problem or making it all better, and certainly as parents, that is often what we're focused on, sometimes it means that we are overlooking the importance of, again, as we said before, naming the feeling and validating that that feeling is okay, whatever that feeling is. And we know that kids experience such a wide range of feelings after the death of a loved one. And that can range from, you know, sadness to fear. Is this going to happen to someone else to, um, you know, even feelings of guilt if they're not, if they don't feel as though they're grieving in the way that society wants them to grieve. And so I think, again, it really goes back to allowing whatever those feelings are to come out and to allow the child to guide the conversation. I think oftentimes as caring adults, we sort of provide them with a ton of information and you know, are trying to elicit all these responses. And the best thing we can do is simply bear witness to their pain and validate that this is hard and to let them know I am here and I'm present and I wanna hear what you have to say, no matter how tough it is to talk about it. So I think that being present and, and really wanting to hear is something that we have found, you know, both anecdotally, but also in the research as one of the most important protective factors after the death of a loved one or after any type of loss 